Hey there, GapFest listeners. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. For the last 19 years, Macy's has partnered with Reading is Fundamental, the nation's largest children's literacy nonprofit, providing 15 million free books to kids across the country. From July 1st to 31st, you can support Reading is Fundamental by rounding up your Macy's in-store purchase or donating online. Stick around to hear from Ingrid, an elementary school principal, and find out how reading is fundamental has impacted the students in her school and greater community. Welcome to GapFest Reads. I'm David Plotz, one of the hosts of the Slate Political GapFest. There's a certain category of art that can be characterized as vicarious suffering the worst journey in the world about uh, Scott's Antarctica expedition or the story of the shackles and voyage, or my father used to always talk about the movie treasure of the Sierra Madre, which he would describe as Humphrey Bogart gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And then he dies. We are fascinated by tales of human endurance beyond endurance and David Graham's unput downable new book, the wager, a tale of shipwreck mutiny and murder is such a book. It is the story of men who suffered a ludicrous amount for no good reason, but it's also much, much more. It's an inquiry into leadership. It's an investigation to how people try to shape history by writing their own version of it. It's an exploration of the culture of the British Navy, and it's just a ripping yarn. And it's no wonder that it's the number one New York Times bestseller. None of this is surprising coming from David Grant, who is, of course, the author of two modern classics of adventure history, The Lost City of Z and Killers of the Flower Moon. David, congratulations on the wager and welcome to GapFest Reads. Thanks so much. I can say one thing about the book is if you read it, no matter what, you will feel better about your own life. That is definitely <laughs> true. Uh, I'll never look at wild celery the same way again. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vinnie. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And here's a fact that could use some serious changing. Did you know that 25 million children in the U.S. cannot read proficiently? That's what is so exciting about Macy's partnership with Reading is Fundamental, the largest children's literacy nonprofit in the nation. They're on a mission to ensure all children have the ability to read and succeed. It's Ingrid's mission, too. I'm Dr. Ingrid Bynum, the proud principal of a K-8 school located in Virginia. So when I was growing up, my family was poor and we could not afford extras such as books. When I was in fourth grade, Reading is Fundamental came to my school to do a book distribution and Riff gave me the very first book I ever owned. And that book changed the trajectory of my life. It was the start to my love of reading. As a principal, the best part about Riff is that every child in the school receives books regardless of their circumstances. Macy's has been pivotal in helping Riff provide new books and resources to students who need them the most. One book, one book to change a child's life. When a child becomes a reader, it opens up many doors for opportunity for them to have an amazing future. Now's the time to inspire a passion for reading among all children. This July, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, You'll help fund Reading is Fundamental in their efforts to close the youth literacy gap across America. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at Macy's.com slash purpose. Let us start with the basics. What was the wager? What was it trying to accomplish? And where did it all go wrong? Yeah, so the the wager, um, after a war had broken out between Great Britain and its imperial rival Spain in 1739, the wager was part of a secret mission with a British squadron to try to sail around Cape Horn and into the Pacific and capture a Spanish galleon filled with so much treasure it was known as the prize of all the oceans. So believe it or not, that was part of the mission. It had a real whiff of piracy about it, even though it was part of a naval uh, expedition. And they set off and uh, almost immediately everything goes wrong. Well, first, even before they set off, everything begins to go wrong because the squadron was short of men. Um, so they are going around pressing uh, people into duty and, and, and forcing these people to go on this mission, even when they didn't want to. They even round up soldiers from a retirement home uh, who are in their 60s and 70s, many of them missing an assortment of limbs. And um, some have to be lifted on stretchers onto the voyage. So the seeds of destruction were planted on the very beginning. And 
and then they encounter storms and scurvies, and eventually the wager shipwrecks on a desolate island off the coast of Patagonia. And of course, that's where the real hell began. Before they get to Wager Island, the island that would be named after them because they were there for so long, you do have this these great descriptions of regular life at sea in the 18th century. Even before there's any shipwreck, it is just unspeakable. The press gangs you talked about, the typhus epidemic, the climbing 100 feet up a mast. That's your job is just climb 100 feet up a mast. And there's no one belaying you. You're not at a rock climbing gym. Uh, you're getting scurvy because they didn't understand how to prevent it. Um, why would anyone do this? Why be, People went to see the British Navy was very powerful. Why was anyone doing this? Well, I think life was hard. On shore too, for poor, very poor people, sometimes the need for food. The one thing you had when you were on a ship was regular meals, and the meals might be more plentiful than if you were a city pauper or a, a town pauper. I think for uh, members of the aristocracy who were not the firstborn, um, in those days the firstborn would inherit the estate from their from their lords. Um, and uh, but if you were the second or third, there were fewer kind of career paths for a reputable job. So some might be, uh, you might go into the church um, and the clergy, you might join the army or you might join a ship. There was still also, um, you know, sea tales that kind of created a romance of life at sea. And one of the members of the ship is John Byron on the wager, whose name, if it is familiar, it is because he would become the grandfather of the poet, Lord Byron. Um, and he was somebody who read all these sea tales and is swept up by uh, by the romance of the sea. He thinks, you know, he's going to write his own story. And of course, it doesn't quite go that way. They end up stranded on this island the, off Patagonia. They immediately kind of fracture into communities, micro communities. And one of the real stories of your book, The Wager, is the way in which this isn't like the the Shackleton expedition or some of the other stories we've heard where it's like there's just discipline and unity and everyone holds together. Why is it different? Why is it that that with The Wager, they, they can't keep it together? Yeah. So, um, I mean, Shackleton was a remarkable leader. And What's interesting about Shackleton is he always fielded in his expeditions. Like he never actually made it to the South Pole. He never walked treks across Antarctica. But kind of when everything went to hell, he had these kind of remarkable abilities to keep everybody unified and to save them. And on the wager, they had already suffered so much. Many of the men had been pressed and recalcitrant from the very beginning. So the challenge of kind of forging them into a band of brothers was enormous. I mean, Shackleton had carefully selected the people he wanted on his on his uh, expedition and this kind of small elite number that filled these characteristics that he thought would survive under these. So this was not the case. So you have about 145 people on the island. You have people from all walks of life. You have, as I said, city paupers, you have aristocrats. You have dandies. You have people who are, you know, so young. You know, you know, eight or nine. You have the midshipman who is sixteen. The cook is eighty. Um, all kind of thrown together. The circumstances are extraordinarily harsh um, on that island. They hoped it might be their salvation, but it's windswept and cold and wet, and they can find virtually no food. And starvation can really affect you. And then they don't have a captain who is quite like Shackleton. His name was uh, David Sheep. He was somebody who had always dreamed of becoming a commander. Um, And he finally had achieved that dream on this voyage until the wreckage. And he's more tempestuous. He's missing some of those kind of mysterious ingredients of leadership, which is to kind of cajole and inspire and sympathize in these very harsh conditions. He's a bit rigid and stubborn. In another life, in a different fate, he might have been very triumphant. But in this situation, in these circumstances, he is in many ways ill-suited. And so as they're starving, they begin to fracture into these warring camps. There's a class struggle on the island, even though they wouldn't use those terms uh, in those days, um, because Cheap was someone who was commander, even though he was plagued by debts on shore, um, he still came from the upper crust so he could be commander of a ship. But more and more of the men are gravitating to the gunner named John Bulkley. And John Bulkley is in many ways an instinctive leader. He's very resilient. He was perhaps the most skilled seaman on the wager. But on a ship, 
because he did not come from the aristocracy, he could never have been a commander in his own right. So on the island, suddenly his abilities in this kind of what I call this democracy of suffering allows him to emerge as a commander and they begin to fracture. Of course, there's a third group who just kind of descend into total wild chaos. They're known as the seceders and they just kind of roam the island pillaging. But there are these two main groups, loyal, one loyal to Captain Cheap and one gravitating to John Bulkley. And what's so interesting is even as they're starving and suffering, they're holding these philosophical debates about the nature of leadership and duty and patriotism. You know, Cheap is very patriotic. He thinks you must sacrifice yourself for the empire. Bulkley is saying, using phrases that would appeal to uh, the American colonists in the rebellion. He literally uses the phrase life and liberty. This is a really interesting book because it is, it's this adventure story, but it's also kind of a story about how you tell your story. And you have reconstructed the story of the wager from remarkable documents. Talk a little bit about, you know, how you tell the story and also how how can you believe that the story you tell is true, given that it's 280 years old and, you know, it's these accounts that people are making for totally self-serving reasons? Yeah. So, I mean, the thing that really drew me. So, first of all, there's this surprising trove of primary materials that somehow I have no idea survived this expedition. You know, the thing about the British Empire is they like to record. They wanted to meticulously document things. And so there, so there are all these records, there are these log books and muster books and diaries and journals that survived this expedition. You, you go to England and you open up these boxes and you can literally pull these documents out. What does it look like? Actually, can you just talk? I, I was very curious. Like, can you, are you allowed to handle any of this stuff? Can you, can you actually read it when you look at it? You can read them. I mean, you, you they come in a box. Uh, often they have leather bound covers that are disintegrating, like a covering and just dust. Like when you open the box, dust just infiltrates your nose, your nostrils. Um, you have to lay them on pillows because otherwise they will further disintegrate. You have to turn the pages so, so gently. Sometimes they are water stained and a little bit rubbed out, but for the most part, you can read them. Sometimes you need a help of a magnifying glass. But for example, the log books are meticulous records day by day of what happened that would allow me to vividly reconstruct what happened. And of course, it takes some experience to learn how to read these documents. So for example, a muster book is just in a listing of enrollment of when a person joins a ship, their name, their rank, when they join, but they often have a symbol next to their name. And when I was first, you know, I'm not a British naval historian. It took me a while to get used to these documents. Um, I kept noticing there was a symbol next to their names. that kept saying so many of them had the letters DD, just the capital DD, DD, DD. And I was like, what is that? And then eventually I learned that DD means discharge debt. And, and so I realized that the muster book, which in some way seems like kind of gibberish and anodyne document, really kind of told the horrific toll on the voyage. I mean, you realize that nearly 2,000 people had set sail on this voyage. And when you do the tallies of the DD, more than 1,300 of them perished. So, um, so these documents speak, and they speak in these kind of startling, unexpected ways. But one of the things that drew me to the story is, is, is what you were saying. I mean, it's just an incredible adventure story. It's one of the more extraordinary sagas of survival and suffering and mayhem I'd ever come across. But what was equally fascinating was what happened after several of these survivors incredibly make it back to England. And there, after everything they have endured, shipwreck, scurvy, starvation, violence among the shipwrecks, they're summoned to face this court martial and they could be hanged for the crimes. And so Joan Didion famously said, we all tell ourselves stories in order to live. And they quite literally have to tell their stories in order to live, because if they don't tell a convincing tale, they may get hanged. And so they also, these other documents, as they begin to release their journals and their testimony, or they write narratives, trying to shape the story out of self-interest, as you said, um, to try to save their own lives. And so I would be going to these archives and reading these disintegrating documents, and there would be this war over the truth. And there would be misinformation. You could read about allegations of fake journals, that people were faking the journals or plagiarizing the journals and rewriting them to serve different interests. And then, of course, I would come home and this fits your gab fest. And what would I, you know, I turn on your gab fest. And what would I be hearing? I'd be hearing talks about alternative facts and fake news. And, and, and so I realized that this weird story had this incredibly surprising resonance with today. And so what I decided to do was to tell the story from the warring perspectives of three members of the expedition. 
One was the captain, David Cheap. One was the gunner, John Bulkley. And one was the young midshipman, John Byron. And what's interesting is they don't lie so much. At, they don't disagree over the basic facts. Like if someone was killed, they were killed. They were shot by this person. But the way they tell their stories is true to the way many of us tell our stories is that they shape them and burnish them and edit them and revise them. What do they leave out of their stories? And you can tell that. I'll just give you one very glaring, vivid example. One person may describe on the island in his account, he'll say, I was forced to proceed to extremities. And then if you look at the account from John Byron, he'll write, oh, yeah, he shot him right in the head and he bled out of my arms. And you begin to get a better sense of where the reality lies. So hopefully by reading the three accounts, you learn how we both shape stories to serve our own self-interest. Um, and I think you get closer to the truth. But I really try to leave it to the reader to interpret and offer that judgment. I was talking to my mother about this, and she was citing to me the Duke of Wellington's line, you know, the British Navy is made up on rum, sodomy, and the, the lash. And I was saying to her, well, the wager has a lot of, of rum in the lash, but not sodomy. And it actually made me ask, like, are there parts of life which they don't touch? Well, that's a really interesting uh, question. I mean, uh, in terms of cases of sodomy, you can dig up court martial records and other ships and find records of, of that. But yes, there's definitely going to be parts in their narratives that they don't touch or leave out. For example, the cannibalism on the island, this kind of taboo that they succumb to when they when they descend into this Hobbesian depravity is handled very cryptically um, and not gone into a great depth. And it's John Byron who actually many years after the expedition kind of fesses up and describes it. Um, but even then, he kind of refers to it as, you know, this last extremity. You know, he doesn't even like to use the term cannibalism. Um, so you see that. And then what you also see, which is really important, I think, is the stories, not just what they leave out, but the stories that are entirely left out. And I tell the story on this expedition of um, a seaman named John Duck. And John Duck was a, a, a black free seaman uh, on the wager. Um, and he was somebody who had survived everything. I mean, he had survived the typhoons and the sickness. He had survived the shipwreck. And then he's part of one of these castaway voyages, you know, where they where they travel thousands of miles. I mean, just, they're just crazy on these tiny ships. And yet, unlike some of these other survivors whose accounts I'm drawing on, he is unable to share his story. He can't tell the story. And the reason is, is because he's kidnapped and sold into slavery. And I could find no record of what had happened to him. And I think it's very important to highlight those stories that are left out. That is one where we know something happened and we can't tell that story as a historian because the record doesn't exist. And I, you know, the story isn't just about how individuals tell their stories to shape their lives and to survive, but also about how empires and nations tell their stories to serve their self-interest. And this is a case, you know, where they preserve their power, not only by the stories they tell, but also by the stories they don't tell, by those pages that are quite literally ripped out of the history books. And John Ducks is just one of many of them. Right. And there's also, of course, the wonderful multiple encounters you describe between the English sailors and the native peoples they encounter, who I presume have vanished to history that there's not written records you're able to consult. Exactly. The, the, you're, you're seeing that story refracted through the through the castaway zone accounts. But it's a, a really interesting encounter because it kind of undercuts the central claim of the British Empire, which is, you know, part of this mission, um, you know, it's after gold and treasure, it's very piratical, but it's also part of this kind of empire, which sees itself as the vanguard of Western civilization, you know, and and yet here they are on the island descending into chaos. And suddenly out of the out of the fog and the mist arrive these canoes with these Karasquar, who were these indigenous Patagonians, whose people had lived in this region for hundreds of years. And they had adapted to the very harsh uh, climate and geography, so much so that NASA later would study them before they were trying to set people into space. 
And um, today, most of the care school have disappeared. There's just a few few left. And um, but in any case, when the when they come, they offer the castaways this lifeline. You know, they go out, they know how to find food. So they go out and they go out to different parts and they bring them back this food. Um, but yet, you know, the castaways and, and many of their accounts describe the Karasquar as savages and mistreat them. And what we know is that eventually the Karasquar, you know, John Byron, you know, to his great lament describes how certain castaways drove them away. And 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 so they lose their lifeline. And that's when they descend only further into kind of murderous anarchy and chaos. And that's where they really begin to succumb to cannibalism too. And so it really does undercut the central claim of the British empire about this notion that their civilization is superior to all others. How did you come across the story of the wager originally? I was doing research on mutinies and I came across John Byron's account. And what was interesting about John Byron's account was it was written in this kind of very stilted prose, you know, that S's were printed as F's. That's kind of tangled. He, he didn't quite write like his uh, grandson, the poet. And it's kind of written in this tangled prose. And yet I kept pausing over these very arresting descriptions. You know, he referred to the typhoon around Cape Horn as the perfect hurricane. And he describes the cannibals and the madness from the scurvy as the disease gets into the brains and they go raving mad. And so I began to realize that this weird little book held these clues to what was one of the more extraordinary sagas I'd ever heard of. You ended up visiting Wager Island. Did you have any of the wild celery that they ate? Was there any still there? I did. I tasted it. I did. So I got to the island. Uh, not not an easy uh, not an easy trek. I must confess, it, it took a long time to get there. I went in a little wood heated boat. Uh, seas were extraordinarily rough. I got at least a glimpse. And again, I wasn't in any kind of tempest or anything, but just even in the normal stormy seas, you know, the boat was just being tossed about. I had to sit on the deck. You couldn't stand. You break a limb. Otherwise, I was like, you know, basically doped on every form of uh, uh, anti-seasick medicine possible. Uh, and I was listening to an audio recording of Moby Dick, which I, I just like to tell because it just reminds me of my complete stupidity why I'm listening to this te- this this book to calm down and said it's just stressing me out. Um, but in any case, I did get to the island and I explore the area where they had built their encampment. And initially what was interesting is they had tried to kind of build this imperial outpost at first, you know, a little settlement. And they tried to be governed by the same rules that had operated by the ship. And Captain Cheap is determined to be their leader and governed by the same rules. And of course, that eventually all uh, unravels. Um, but just like when they were there, it remains a place of wild desolation. The trees are all bent on 45 degree angles from the unrelenting wind, and we can find virtually no food. But we did, to answer your question, find these sprouts of celery, which I tried, uh, kind of bitter and dirty when I tasted it. I didn't boil it or anything. It was the one thing that actually had a mysterious benefit to the castaways, uh, because you know they were suffering from scurvy by the time of the wreck. And what they didn't know was that the cure of scurvy was so simple, all it required was a little vitamin C, some vegetables and fruit in their diet. And so, I mean, the celery had some uh, uh, vitamin C in it. So to them, it's kind of a miracle, but their scurvy gets better. After doing all this work and experiencing a little bit of what they experienced and and reading deeply about their experience, for them, was there any romance of the sea left after this? Did, Did some of them, I mean, Jack Byron, John Byron did go back to sea. Yeah. And that's interesting because it goes back to your earlier question too, why would anyone go back to sea? And I think it does get at something that the, these these voyages did offer some of them. Some of them, obviously, you know, most of them perished. Captain Cheap does eventually go back to sea very briefly and actually captures a little bit of a, a Spanish ship with some wealth on it that allows him to retire, um, although he would be always stained, his reputation would be always stained from this expedition. But John Byron actually does go back to sea and climbs the naval ranks, rises to become an admiral. And I think he never, he was always plagued. He was, his nickname was Foul Weather Jack because he always had storms. But, you know, I think he was always looking for a bit of this kind of community, this kind of fellowship of seamen that could happen in the wooden world. And I think he did find that uh, on these uh, voyages. So he does go back, uh, but many others don't and they kind of vanish from history. And many of them who made it back uh, continued to suffer from, you know, ailments. Even Captain Sheep dies uh, not that much long after. And he had always been plagued from the diseases and illnesses he had suffered on this expedition. Are there any 
extant or reconstructed man of wars that you can go on and what does it feel like to be on one yeah i highly recommend going to portsmouth um and visiting uh admiral nelson's uh, uh vice admiral Horatio nelson's victory ship which was built a little bit later it built a bit later in the 18th century obviously that was his famous ship at trafalgar um but it is the longest serving commission naval ship i think it's still under commission it's still part of the navy they still raise the flag i don't think it never goes out to sea or anything um and they constantly have to rebuild it because these ships you know what was so interesting about these ships is that you know they were these engineering marvels of their time these really complex instruments they're be- meant to be both kind of murderous instruments because there were war vessels but they're also meant to be the homes where people would live together side by side for years at a time um, but they were made of these very perishable materials which was wood so you constantly have to repair them or the, or the ships would sink. So it's constantly being remade. Um, normally, a ship, a, a warship only had about a 12-year lifespan, according to one uh, uh, shipmaker uh, at that time. But that is a ship you can go on. It's bigger than the wager, but you can go on it. You could see how they ate. The mess tables would come down where they would eat right between the um, cannons. So they're like eating between the cannons. Um, this ordinary seaman usually had about a foot between them when they were in their hammocks. Um, and you can really get a sense of what life, you know, the low decks <laughs> bending your bending your head. So it's a great museum piece because it is actually the actual ship. And so I spent a lot of time on that just trying to, I had a British naval historian basically give me, um, I got him to come with me and basically give me endless tutorials uh, on what it was like on a ship so I could understand and describe it. David Grand's magnificent new book is The Wager, A Tale of Shipwreck, Mutiny, and Murder. David, congratulations. Thanks for coming on GapFest Read. Oh, it's just my pleasure. Thank you so much. And listeners, just remember, if you go on a voyage, always bring your lines. You'll find out soon enough. That's it for this month's edition of GapFest Read. Our producer, Shana Roth, Ben Richmond, the Senior Director of Operations, Slate Podcast. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Audio at Slate. We will be back next month with another edition of GapFest Reads. Until then, John, Emily, and I will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GapFest.